gonna try and keep this video as concise as possible, but there's a lot to unpack here, so it may end up becoming uh, fairly long-winded, but it's really important that you pay attention to this, especially if you're in an area where the conflict is likely to grow to, the one that we're seeing right now in Europe, because it shows no signs of slowing down. Now, we can look at some recent case study with the conflict in Europe and see the applicable use of what we're gonna discuss here today, and that is the civil defense belt. One of the big takeaways from all this as well is that this concept is based around a long-lasting civil emergency. So your body has to be hardened to carry this belt over and over again every single day because you're going to put it on in the morning and it's going to stay on until your duty day is over. You can also look at cases here in the United States over the last several years where a civil defense belt, a law enforcement style or security style belt actually is more applicable than the GWAT style battle belts or go to war belts that we see a lot of guys rocking. Now the accessories for those uh, they've improved with time. There's more and more molly capable duty style equipment. So if you already have one of those belts, you may want to look at the bit of kit that we're going to explore today and consider adding some of that to your belt or at least having it on standby to add to your belt should you need to do so. Now the belt we're going to look at today being based around mostly security and law enforcement, there's a reason for that. What is the primary function that you're going to serve during a WROL or SHTF type event? Well, you're pulling security. So having a belt that really only carries lethal force options is probably not the best option for you in most cases. Even looking to Ukraine, one of the earliest functions that a lot of individuals served when they were activated only within hours of their activation with no prior experience, they were mobilized to begin arresting people who were believed to have sympathies with the Russian Federation or known ties to the Russian Federation. So keep that in mind. That might be one of the first things you end up doing if you're in Europe is you might be mobilized to begin detaining people and serving mostly in a security or policing uh, type capacity. You may end up securing rear line areas, especially if you're older. Maybe you're not necessarily fit under current standards for frontline service. So again, you need to look at the big picture here and realize that having the ability to detain people, training ahead of time with the equipment that you would use to detain someone, or even having those options where you can deploy uh, less than lethal force. For example, OC spray if you're able to obtain it ahead of time. I know that's very heavily regulated in a lot of the world, and tasers might be as well. And you can obtain those surplus for a fairly reasonable amount of money if you hunt. You can get some of the latest generations of tasers, trade-in models from departments for as little as $200, slap a new battery in there, get a new production cartridge, and you're good to go for probably less than $300 with an X26 or something like that. So that's definitely worth exploring. Now, if you think the likelihood of you being activated for civil policing action or something along those lines is impossible, even in the United States, we need to look no further than the Cold War and civil defense. It did happen, and I would submit if you're in a more rural area, the likelihood of this happening, the likelihood of you backfilling law enforcement is much, much greater than likely backfilling in a city. You will likely be acting in an unofficial role or capacity if you're in the city, and you need to explore your options carefully in those environments. You need to clearly and plainly identify yourself that you are not part of the government forces or not part of the regime uh, very clearly unless you have been empowered in that type of a role, unless you have been given official duties or insignia or things uh, to denote your authority, you want to uh, not misrepresent your role and your capability either, especially if the hostility is directed at government forces or in the event you end up perhaps detaining someone, maybe you guys form an ad hoc neighborhood watch, but again, this is the type of thing that requires pre-planning, as does everything on this belt. This is not stuff you're gonna go run out and obtain in the middle of a crisis. This is stuff you have to get ahead of time ideal not at all you can't just swing down to the local surplus shop you know day two <laughs> hey you guys got any alice gear and one of the big things i want to hit on as well is you may need to have a number of different holsters if you live in a country that does not have the uh, best defensive tool rights you will need a variety of different holsters to accommodate the most common service pistols in your country so get the best quality holsters you can and one other caveat to all this I would encourage you to go surplus on virtually everything we'll be exploring today, if possible. Some of these items, again, might be controlled in your country, but you will likely be able to buy them from third-party uh, sellers overseas. You can legally own holsters, you can legally own belts, you might have some issues with the OC spray, and I'm not sure, depending on where you live, you may have some issues obtaining handcuffs as well, but you likely can obtain 
flex cuffs or other useful options if you have to detain or hold someone, but explore your local laws. Know what the limitations are in the role that you were in. If you were just a private citizen, again, acting in a neighborhood watch capacity, which is most likely to be the case, especially here in the West, you need to be very well aware of what uh, the legal authority that you actually have in that environment is if it's uh, even just questioning someone. If they don't want to stay put, if they just want to move through, you're not going to have the right to just hold them. So speak to an attorney ahead of time. Make sure you are familiar with case law and make sure you know your responsibility and make sure you are aware of how to not misrepresent yourself and your capacity if you're not acting, again, in an official role on behalf of an estate or whoever it is that you're serving at that particular time. So let's go ahead and look at the belt itself. Now let me stress again, this is all stuff you have to get ahead of time and it's stuff you have to train with ahead of time and it's stuff that you need to be very comfortable using. That's why you have to take training classes. Ones that involve some scenario and role play as well because it's not likely that in your current capacity that you will be actively using this stuff on a frequent basis. So you need to stay up to date with it. You need to get the training now while you can, so you're not thrown into a situation where you don't have any experience with this kit, and now you're expected to use it. And that's the exact mistake that we saw that too many people made over the last year in Ukraine. Now, first and foremost, what are the most important elements of this belt? Well, it's gonna be the underbelt, and it's gonna be the belt keepers. Now you could certainly go with a Velcro underbelt. That is absolutely a viable option, but keep in mind that stuff wears out over time. It can get dirty and it tends to tear up your pants in my experience. So I'm not a huge fan of Velcro underbelts. This underbelt is from Elite Survival Systems. It uses that nice high quality Cobra buckle. And I would very much encourage you to look into something like this. I have a link in the description below for this particular one that I've been using for months now. And it's a great belt. Now, the duty belt itself, we're gonna start from right to left and we're gonna talk about the different bits and pieces on here, but you have to get training. Again, I'm gonna stress that, look into the training you need, the permits that you need to obtain this type of kit or carry this type of kit because there may be numerous restrictions that you have to deal with ahead of time. And we saw in Ukraine that playing the weight game is a great mistake because you may be thrust into a role or position that you have no real expertise in or even some basic knowledge or primer level knowledge to really adequately deal with this if you wait until the invasion begins. Do not delay, get this training now and slowly accumulate this stuff over the next several weeks or months because you may end up needing it sooner rather than later, especially as we head into winter. So on the far right, we've got our OC spray and the belt itself is made by Tactical Tailor. I've had this one for oof, eight years or more now and it's held up just fine. Uh, the uh, pouch is from True Spec or something for the handcuffs. It's a set of Pearlis. I would recommend the Smith & Wessons and these two items for sure are something you want to get training on. They're no joke and you need to stay up to date with the handcuff training because that's not something you're gonna likely be doing all the time in your role, uh, right now anyway. Uh, in the future, you may end up again needing this type of stuff and you need to take some training where there's some added stress and role playing in those courses so you feel confident in the deployment of the stuff, especially in a real high stress scenario. Now, the holster is a Safari Land SLS holster rock in the SP 2022. If you can obtain a Safari Land holster, as I said, you need to do that. They are the best open carry duty holster available, period, that I've ever seen around the world. And I've looked at a lot of different holsters over the past several months from different countries, and just the quality, the fit and finish, the ruggedness of the SLS holster cannot be understated. And if you live in an area where the common pistols in circulation uh, will take one of these holsters or there are SLS style holsters from Safari Land for those pistols, grab a couple. You can get them on the second hand market for anywhere between 30 and 80 bucks depending on the model of pistol and whether or not it accepts a weapons light. So something to look into, again, depending upon where you are, but get 
the common style duty holsters that your country has. How many people do we see in Ukraine who showed up to get an AK issued and all they had was civilian clothes and they're being given this Cold War era mag pouch and an AK and told good luck. That's not a good plan, guys. Don't delay on any of this. We've seen too many people who have been taking ad hoc crash courses on basic marksmanship over the past several months. Don't be in that situation. It's one thing to go out there and practice the fundamentals with one of those groups. It's another thing to have that be your first time handling a rifle or a pistol. Don't, don't delay. I really can't stress that enough with everything that's going on over there right now and with the mobilizations and with all the different programs that Russia is putting into place right now for even wider scale and larger scale mobilization. And I'm actually going to talk about that in a future video of what they're doing with the Ratnik program and some of the modernization of their kit right now. It's pretty interesting. Moving along, uh, one of the things I added to this belt uh, that I'm a really big fan of is this pad. And it helps distribute the weight more evenly uh, across my back and it puts less pressure on my hips. If you're not used to wearing duty gear for extended periods of time, it can definitely cause a substantial amount of discomfort. So you do need to wear this around the house. You need to get used to the weight of this. If all you can obtain, for example, is an airsoft pistol for now that you can at least dry fire practice with, I would encourage you to do that. Figure out solutions to possible problems in what I'm presenting to you today. Again, if certain things are controlled or regulated, find alternatives. If you can't get OC spray, but you can get a baton perhaps, consider that. And all of that will also dictate how you're going to set your belt up, but I would encourage you to have at least one less than lethal option on your belt. Again, remember, not every scenario requires a hammer. Moving on to the rest of the belt here, we have this excellent Streamlight flashlight, which can also be used as an impact weapon. Uh, next to that, we've got the uh, tourniquet, and then we have a three cell mag pouch from HSGI. Now, if I was to take this belt into the bush, I would certainly lighten the load a bit. And if you already have, as I mentioned, a G-Watch style battle belt, this is Molly capable. They make Molly capable of, this is actually a Molly capable pouch as well. So you can get Molly capable pouches of all of this to add to your pre-existing G-Watch style battle belt or go to war belt. Uh, if you're going to end up acting in one of the capacities that we previously touched on in this video. So that's a basic look at the setup that I'm rocking at present. As I said, it gives you a lot more capability than the conventional battle belt. Uh, maybe some things to add if you're thinking about it. Perhaps you add a ready mag to this. So maybe you add an, a rifle magazine somewhere to this belt. Now, in that case, I would likely rearrange things. For example, if I was to run a taser, I would likely be running the taser where this three cell mag pouch is. I would likely then move the OC spray uh, behind my pistol and there's a few things that would get shifted around for example if I was running a taser on this belt so as I said the laid out and the loadout is going to change a little bit with your experience uh, it's going to change a little bit when you add things to this belt and when you take some training if you can take some ground based training which you might end up doing if you do take some handcuff training which I would encourage if you're going to get handcuffs because it's not as easy as it looks in the movies or TV. Most people are not willingly going to go into them. So you need to be fairly competent and comfortable putting those on someone. Now, should you find yourself in a similar position to the Ukrainians uh, who were put into those roles and positions only hours after the invasion. Uh, anyway, guys, what are your thoughts on all this stuff? Uh, one of the things I would add to, if you're going to strip this belt down or deploy like a tourniquet pouch or something uh, in the bush or in a more of a combat role, I would recommend one that actually uh, has an additional layer of retention over the top because this, this does not. This is from HSGI and this one's really more set up for the idea of rocking on a duty belt uh, for these purposes. But anyway, make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Leave your comments below. Uh, what do you think about this concept? Do you see yourself adopting some of this kit or having this as a maybe second line system uh, in the event you are responding to a wide scale or large scale civil unrest event?